climate change, both warming and cooling, is a natural hazard on all timescales, from annual or seasonal even, right through to hundreds, thousands, and millions of years. Okay, so if natural climate change is the real problem, what is the government doing about it? Well, the government, of course, has a plan. It's called... <laughs> it's called Plan A. And what Plan A says is, stop global warming. Well, what are these, what are these guys doing? Who are they? Well, you can see what they're doing. I mean, here's the temperature curve, and it's obviously wrong, because it's going down over the last 10 years. That's got to be wrong. So they're looking for the right temperature curve, and the guy in the middle finds it, and here it is. This is the famous hockey stick curve. Anyway, he's happy, he found it, and he was rewarded because he was given a Nobel Prize, and there he is celebrating his Nobel Prize. What was in it for him was a Nobel Prize, squillions of dollars, and power and influence. That's what the United Nations is all about. What about this gentleman, Prime Minister of New Zealand, and this lady, the Prime Minister of Australia, what was in it for them? And the answer is, ah, money, taxes. $25 a ton, $2,508 extra per family per year in new taxes. And in principle, there's nothing wrong with paying taxes provided we get a benefit. The key here is cost-benefit analysis. So what's the benefit? Well, Bob, you must be an idiot. Of course you know the benefit. We're going to stop global warming. We're going to have not so much warming as otherwise we would have. Ah, oh, is that so, Prime Minister? So how much... Warming is going to be averted, Prime Minister. And this is the question that Andrew Bolt has been trying to get answered for the last month. Not a single government politician or scientific advisor will answer the question. And in a moment, you'll see why. But that's the question. How much warming will be averted? Well, those of you that know this number aren't going to be shocked. The rest of you are going to be flabbergasted. The answer is 0 0.001 degrees. One thousandth of one degree Celsius and that's the projection of a computer model, and we all know what we think of computer models to boot. So that's the amount of warming we will get if we reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 10% by 2050. If we stopped Australia's economy altogether, you would increase that by an order of magnitude, and you would have 0.01, one one hundredth of a degree. Neither of those numbers are measurable on the instruments they use at meteorological stations to measure temperature. This policy, you could not have a policy that was more discriminatory against the people in our society who are finding it hard to make ends meet already, than to lumber them with this sort of extra tax, sorry, over there, for something that will have no measurable effect on the climate whatsoever. Believe it or not, in the EU, they estimate that if they do this by 2100, there'll be a cooling of six one hundredths of a degree. Again, that's not discernible in any real practical terms. And they will spend $380 billion a year, a total of $34 trillion a year by the end of the century. The definition of insane is out of the rational mind. Without being rude to anybody, but as a perfectly factual statement, these are insane policies. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the reality and that's why I've tried so far in this talk to not make political remarks, I made a, may have made a few jokes, but I've been sharing with you the science background. I'm going to finish with one political slide, but before we get to that, what should we do now? We're in a fix. We've got to stop this, but we can only stop it by having a reasonable, sensible alternative. Well, what this is all about is hazard. And New Zealand, as you know, has earthquakes, we've just had a classic example of that, and volcanic eruptions. And in New Zealand, they understand that in terms of major costs and major loss of life, the biggest risks are earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Sure, they have storms, floods and bushfires, but on their scale of things, they're secondary risks. In Australia, it's exactly the other way around. Our big risks are bushfires, floods and storm damage, as we've seen in the last two or three years. Right, so the key thing that all of these have in common is that they are unpreventable, and they're unpredictable. Exactly the same is true of climate change and to a slightly lesser uh, case, sea level rise. Okay, New Zealand is better than us at some things, like cricket, they got to the semi-finals of the World Cup, remember? <laughs> it's also better than us at natural hazard, and they have a thing called Geonet, 
which is charged with advising the government and the people on these hazards. In five out of the nine hazards, of course earthquakes and volcanoes are in here, but storm, snowfall, landslides, flooding and droughts are all climate related things. And they have a, a thing called GeoNet, which is a web page and we're on the earthquake page and you can go in and click on any one of these recent earthquakes and burrow down and get civil defence advice and the latest, most up-to-date information on how to deal with it. It would be the simplest thing in the world, it hasn't happened yet, for New Zealand to add another tab up here. Earthquake, volcano, landslide, tsunamis, and the next tab could be long-term climate change. This is viewed as world best practice, and without joking, uh, it is certainly something Australia should look at mimicking. We have the problem of overlapping uh, responsibilities between state, federal and volunteer groups and there's a lot of coordination and so on that could be done better in there under some sort of a federal thing like this. Okay, so let's finish by pretending we're Mr. Combe or if you're a lady, Penny Wong who was in the hot chair uh, a year ago. Come on scientists, it's a simple question. Is it going to be like the little ice age in 10 years time? I'll make this easy for you, only 10 years time. Is it going to be like the little ice age? Or is it going to be like the medieval warm period? The answer is nobody knows. And if nobody knows, that's remarkable in terms of what the media is telling you, but nobody knows. If nobody knows, it's a complete no-brainer that you need to prepare for either. Apparently the cabinet can't work this out with all their collective advice and brains, but obviously you need to prepare for either. Policy plan B has to be preparation for all climate hazards, be they short term like bushfires and cyclones, or longer term like droughts, and adaptation to them as they happen. You can read all about it in my book, Climate the Counter Consensus. So I said I would finish with my only political comment, and it's this. There will be no carbon sick, in other words, she means carbon dioxide tax, under the government I lead, says Julia Gillard. Well, here is the parliamentary mandate for that. 150 seats in the House. One MP, Adam Brand of Melbourne, was elected that he would support a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme. 149 MPs were elected on the basis there would be no such tax. That is my only political comment today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.